In one brief but classical moment in time, the ancient citizens of Athens, Greece, built the most magnificent temples that mankind has ever been inspired to create. Towering shrines shrouded with unworldly spirits and mysterious cults that indulged in unspeakable sacrifices. Discover for whom these columned temples were built and learn about the haunting mysteries that still lie buried amongst these marbled wonders of ancient Greece. For over 2,500 years, foreign conquerors, treasure hunters, and violent earthquakes tried, but failed, to completely ravage Athens of its mystical monuments perched on a spiritual citadel called the Acropolis. It was here, in 5th century BC Athens, where the seeds of modern civilization took root. Sexual and artistic freedom flourished. It was the birthplace of democracy, science, philosophy, and theater. Yet these monuments were also sacred sites steeped in cultic worship and secret rituals, where the smell of blood and smoke consumed the air. It was said that Greece is a spring that will never run dry. Yet it is the quest to unlock the mysteries of Athens' magnificent monuments that continues to fire the thirst of man. Risen to glory in the fifth century BC, the city of Athens exploded with artistic and cultural excellence. In less than 50 years, the most brilliant minds known to man created a monumental mecca that eludes us to this day. Why were these monuments built? And what secrets lie buried under this bastion of silent stones? After years of barbarian warfare, what has become of the monuments that were once built for a divine dynasty? Have they sunk into ash and rubble? And what remains of the celestial columns that are now shadows of a paradise lost? The origins of Athens' temples are lost in myth and legend. In prehistoric times, the earliest records from 1000 BC reveal that Attica, the Mediterranean area now known as Greece, was once divided into many city-states, Athens being the most powerful. The Acropolis, which means high city, served as a refuge against enemy attacks. The early Athenians believed that the Greek goddess Athena, protector of life, and Poseidon, god of the sea, competed to rule over Athens. In the contest, Athena created the olive tree, Poseidon, on the other hand, struck his trident down on the limestone rock on the Acropolis and produced a spring of salt water. Yet it was Athena's luscious olive tree that would become the essence of their economy. No one in ancient Greece doubted Athena's supernatural powers. As a result, the creator of the olive tree was proclaimed the divine guardian of Athens. The olive fertile and self-sown, the terror of our enemies that no hand tames or tears away. Sophocles. Since primitive times, the ancient Greeks had always respected their gods and goddesses. Early on, they built small shrines throughout the Mediterranean in honor of them. In 566 BC, the Athenians began building a larger sanctuary on the Acropolis to worship Athena and their other deities. Political disturbances, however, interrupted the construction of the limestone temples. In 480 BC, King Darius of Persia declared war on Attica. Other city-states quickly looked to Athens and its powerful military for help. The Athenians fought Persians on the shores of Marathon and at the Battle of Salamis. After 10 years of Persian barbarity, the Athenians triumphed. 
But their sanctuary on top of the Acropolis was in ruins. Scaffolding smoldered to ashes. The marble crumbled to the ground. The Persian Wars devastated the Athenian spirit. Yet amidst their sorrow, a miracle occurred. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus wrote that the warring Persians had burned the sacred olive tree that Athena had planted on the Acropolis. But within two days, a new shoot sprang forth, a sign that their patron goddess was still protecting the city. The Athenians looked at this as an omen of future success. After their victory over Persia, they began rebuilding their devastated city. Since they now had the largest standing army and navy in the Greek world, Athens persuaded other cities to join a military alliance called the Delian League. With the Delian League, Athens became the guardian of Greece. City-states began paying the treasury of Athens for protection against future enemy attacks. With large sums of gold pouring into Athens, one Athenian statesman was determined to rebuild the Acropolis to its fullest splendor. His name was Pericles. Although an aristocrat himself, Pericles was an engaging orator who compelled the rich, poor, and enslaved. This tart-tongued statesman masterminded the organization of a democratic empire. Pericles spun a feeling of optimism and the spirit of an era that would forever be known as the Golden Age. Our city is an education to Greece. Pericles, 449 BC. For over 30 years, this Golden Age shimmered brightly over Athens. In 449 BC, Pericles commissioned the building of four civic temples on the Acropolis that would be dedicated to their deities. Of the four, the Parthenon would become the most important monument of Western civilization. Pericles hired the finest architects, artists, and sculptors. It took over 10 years to transform massive slabs of limestone into a Mediterranean masterpiece. But how was Pericles' remarkable dream accomplished? Building the Parthenon on the Acropolis became an enormous feat which tested the brute strength of man against the forces of nature. With muscle and might, large gangs of workers, many of whom were slaves, dragged slabs of precious limestone from quarries miles away using only ropes and oxen. The pentelic marble was then placed on carts where teams of horses hauled the material up the steep hill to the Acropolis. Once the structure was completed, the renowned sculptor Phidias adorned the exterior and interior of the Parthenon with hand-carved sculptures and friezes. They depicted the supreme gods of Mount Olympus, battles between the Greeks and Amazons, and Lapids fighting centaurs. Phidias was idolized throughout Greece. His most awesome achievement was a 40-foot gold and ivory sculpture of the goddess Athena with a six-foot statue of the Nike of Victory, which stood in the palm of her hand. In order to protect the gold and ivory sculpture from tempted thieves, the statue of Athena was built in parts so it could be periodically dismantled and the gold could be weighed, just to make sure the patrons of the temple hadn't been chiseling away at its costly structure. If the gold came up short, it was said the whole city would suffer the wrath of Athena. One can this day, to this day have a sense of being a part of those files of columns like soldiers at attention or Greek citizens standing. And when the great doors were swung open, they could see, perhaps a little dimly, the huge ivory and gold statue of the goddess inside. But while they were getting to the Parthenon, they passed another huge statue of her between the gateway, the Propylia, and the Parthenon. A huge stat standing statue of Athena in battle array. 
You couldn't get away from her <laughs> in your thoughts, in the word itself, in her presence in Athens. Regarding the statue of Athena, the ancient writer Plutarch wrote that the great statesman Pericles brought the most delightful adornment to Athens and to the rest of mankind, which testified that her power and splendor was not idle fiction. It's the buildings themselves. There's something there, intangible, hard to describe, hard for any of us to describe, but that has to be experienced in person. The contrast of the sunlight, the blue sky, the rough Acropolis stone, and then the finely honed perfection of the workmanship and the proportions that one sees and their significance today as icons of the past. While the exterior of the Parthenon glistened against the Mediterranean sky, the interior also shimmered with a wealth of treasures. They included silver coins, gold vessels, and red clay pottery. The Parthenon held a treasure trove for its patron goddess Athena, but what mysteries loomed inside this marbled wonder? Lord Nestor began the sacrifice, holding the bowls of holy water and barley. Thrasymedes struck the ox a mighty blow. His axe severed the tendons of its neck. The watching women cried out. Dark blood poured out, and life left the carcass. Homer, the Odyssey. The ancient Athenians performed sacred rituals for their gods to keep the evil spirits at bay. On the Acropolis, such sacrificial ceremonies occurred every four years when Athens put on a grand birthday party called the Panathenaea Festival in honor of their patron goddess, Athena. Up until the 5th century BC, the land of Attica, the region now known as Greece, was covered with small shrines and cult centers dedicated to their gods who were said to live on the top of a snowy peak called Mount Olympus. The Panathenaea Festival was the first attempt in ancient Athens to create a national cult for all of its citizens to celebrate. The festival included a grand procession with young cavalrymen on their horses clattering up to the Parthenon with marshals in between them. Young maidens followed them, carrying garments and a sacred cloth for the goddess Athena. The cult statue of Athena was dressed up, was given a new robe, and I suspect that it was also given earrings and jewelry, so it got a new, a whole new apparatus. And the appearance of the cult statue must have been seen as a kind of epiphany of Athena for the common people. The festival was peppered with wine, women, and song. Athletic and singing contests were performed in honor of the gods. The winners usually received a large jar of olive oil, which was almost as precious as gold. Ancient epigraphs reveal that the statue of Athena presided over a ceremony where bulls and sheep were sacrificed. On some festival days, over a hundred animals would be slaughtered as offerings to the patron goddess. The Acropolis was, was filled with, uh, with cult, so to say, and with cult monuments. What happened is that you had these temples surrounding an open space. And in this open space, the sacrifices took place because you have to have a, a bit of a public space for the people to gather, for the populace to gather. And the main rituals that happened here during the festivals were, first of all, sacrifices of animals. That is the common thing. Questions persist of where the sacrifices actually took place. Many archaeologists believe that they must have been performed outside the temple due to the carnage and amount of blood that must have been spilled. The archaeological evidence on the Acropolis itself is very hazy. Uh, of course, we have a place between the temples where we think the sacrifices took place, but no altar has been found. The ancient Athenians were very superstitious about appeasing their gods. On these festival days, and even on non-festival days, any citizen could go to a certain temple and take part in a sacrifice to ask a particular deity for a favor. 
Greek peasants would typically ask for economic aid or better luck with the harvest of their crops. Women would frequently ask the gods for aid in childbirth and raising healthy babies. Were animals the only things Athenians sacrificed as offerings to the gods? Answers to this question might be hidden on a frieze that wrapped around the interior facade of the Parthenon. For centuries, historians believed this sculpted panel depicted the birthday party to Athena. But new theories suggest that this frieze may symbolize the myth of a brutal sacrifice of three virgin women to the gods to save Athens from the warring Persians. Human sacrifice in ancient Greece was definitely carried out into the historical period. Uh, it seems to have been used only in times of dire necessity, when there's a plague, a famine, or a military problem, and you need to propitiate the gods to end this terrible misfortune. Human sacrifice had been discontinued by the Golden Age. Although the controversy whether the Parthenon frieze suggests the sacrifice of three women continues. Through the ancient Roman travel writer Pausanias, historians do agree that cult worship flourished, particularly inside the Erechtheion, considered the most sacred temple on the Acropolis. Outside the Erechtheion, an oil lamp perpetually burned day and night. Inside the temple were shrines and cultic worship to many gods. The ancient Roman writer Pausanias observed that in front of the temple's entrance was an altar to the god Zeus. There, nothing was sacrificed that breathed, and no wine could be served. However, the ancient Greeks did offer sweet cakes to their imposing god. The Erechtheion was the last of the major buildings built on the Acropolis. Properly speaking, we really should be calling it the Temple of Athena Polius because it housed the most important image of Athena on the Acropolis. This was a very ancient wooden image that may have even fallen from the sky, according to one ancient author. The Erechtheion was considered a jewel of architecture. On the north side of the temple is the alluring Porch of Maidens, six magical sculptures of beautiful women who serve as columns holding up the sacred temple. Much speculation has surrounded these women. Who were they? One ancient Roman architect said they symbolized maidens captured in a battle in the fifth century. Other archeologists believe they are the daughters of King Cecrops, who is believed to be buried underneath the temple. It is often assumed that it was there at the southwest corner and that the porch of the maidens, that the maidens themselves perhaps represent the daughters of King Kikrops, but no burial was recovered in any of the, the excavations in the last century. The Eric Theon was shrouded with unworldly spirits, but what secrets loom inside the third monument that was built on the sacred hill? The Temple of Athena Nike is located near the entranceway leading up to the Acropolis. Built after the completion of the Parthenon in 432 BC, this magical temple is smallest and the most delicate monument on the site. Excavation of ancient inventories revealed this shrine also housed the statue of the goddess Athena, as well as serving as a treasury that resembled a modern day bank. The citizens of Athens brought their money and valuables to the temple for safekeeping. But the Athenians thought it only proper to pay interest to the goddess for the privilege of keeping their money there. And no one dared steal anything from under the watchful eye of Athena. The monuments in Athens were not only masterpieces of art, but also political and sometimes sexual expressions of the society which created them. While Athens, Greece was building its own marbled kingdom during the fifth century BC, other countries around the globe were making their own mark in history. In India, a visionary called the Enlightened One founded the Buddhist Empire, which quickly spread across Asia. 
His followers were taught the way to nirvana was to achieve wisdom and renounce negative thoughts. In the Holy Land, the wall of Jerusalem was known to have been erected by Nehemiah and Ezra. It was during this time, too, that the Torah became the moral book of the Jewish state. And in Italy, the imposing Etruscan Empire was slowly caving in to the powers of a new sovereign authority, the Romans, who one day would also rule Athens. The creative spirit on the Acropolis was contagious, gushing down into the heart of the city of Athens called the Agora. During the glorious golden age, the Agora was a place bursting with inspiring minds in search of human excellence. Buried in this garden of rubble are the seeds of Western civilization, hundreds of monuments which symbolized the daily life of a powerful and creative society. I think Athens had a sense of optimism at this time, a sense of power and possibility, a sense of an optimistic future that helped to fuel the creativity in the visual arts and in the literary arts. Athens was the birthplace of literature expressed in the works of the playwrights Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. It produced the first philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And it was the home of the founder of medicine, Hippocrates. But why did the foundations of Western civilization begin in Athens? The very words that come to us today, the word politics comes from the Greek word polis. And democracy and anarchy and tyranny and oligarchy are all Greek words. And so is drama and tragedy and comedy. And so is athletics. The stadium is a Greek word, the theater is a Greek word. Uh, all of these forms, whether they be architectural forms, whether they be literary forms, whether they be political forms, came together during that golden age. After 2,000 years since its construction, teams of archeologists have brought to the surface the origins of Western thought and society. Since 1931, over 100 ancient buildings and nearly 200,000 antiquities have been dug up from under the modern city. Today, in the Agora, archaeologists are continually in search of ancient Athens. Athens is essentially a massive archaeological site, but the modern city sits directly on top of all of the rest of the ancient city. And if one could tear out 500 buildings, 1,000 buildings, one could expose dozens more ancient buildings which now lie some 15 to 20 feet below the modern street levels. They're there waiting to be discovered. The Agora was the center of town in all respects. Or it's like the mall in Washington, huge big open space with the buildings you need to run the government grouped around it. It was here in the Agora that archeologists first discovered the beginnings of democracy as we know it today. Inspired by the democratic spirit of their leader, Pericles, the ancient Athenians wrote their own constitution. Our constitution is called a democracy because power is in the hands not of a minority, but of the whole people. Pericles, 431 BC. Although slavery was entrenched in their society, most Athenians believed their democratic government worked. Below are the remains of the first House of Representatives building, where 500 Athenian senators once voted on legislation. And it was here where the first jury system was conceived. Instead of nine men and women, uh, it was a jury of 201 or 501 or 1501 Athenian citizens who happened to be sitting on the jury that day who would make essentially the constitutional decision they would have jurors tickets and they would be assigned by lot. You couldn't tell until the court actually began sitting who was going to be a juror that day. So it was very hard to bribe an Athenian jury. Archaeologists have uncovered the stone ballot box and dozens of bronze ballots that were used by jurors to vote to either sentence or set free a defendant. Most cases were heard indoors, but in the case of murder, 
The trial was held outside because the Athenians were superstitious. A potential murderer could pollute the sacred halls of justice. Ancient Greeks were not only concerned with political correctness, but they also believed in enjoying life to its fullest. Athenians credit their god Dionysus. His orgies of wine and dance evolved into the beginnings of theater as we know it today. Near the Agora are the remains of the theater dedicated to Dionysus. It was here the ancient tragedies and comedies were lavishly performed to rousing applause. Come and dance, all you who hear us. Come and worship Dionysus. Crown your head with sacred vine leaves. Raise on high the sacred pine torch. Come and dance. Your god is here. The Bacchae by Euripides. Here in the Agora, archaeologist John Camp is reading an ancient inscription record of the winning poets and producers in comedy and tragedy in a theatrical contest of 400 BC. In Athens, we can see the Academy Awards being awarded in 390 BC. This took place in the theater of Dionysus, which was south of the Acropolis. Very early theater probably took the form of dances in honor of the god. And then gradually actors were added to the performance to tell a story or a particular myth. By the 5th century BC, these plays were being produced over a period of four days and in the form of contests with uh, prizes for the, the various participants. Physical and artistic expression was performed both publicly and privately. Ancient buildings and pottery dug up in the Agora have provided insight into the Athenians' zest for life. They had plenty of fun. Men's drinking banquets are an essential part of life. There were no spirits, of course, nothing distilled. So it's all wine, either watered or not watered. All those ladies uh, and uh, gentlemen having various kinds of sexual adventures and conquests, the whole class of prostitutes is really not quite fair, but shall we say free and easy foxes uh, that were available. And nobody minded this at all. And they were very free about sexual illusion. It wasn't like Victorian times. Fifth century Athens seemed to symbolize the essence of tolerance. Yet the Athenians' tempers eventually ran short with Socrates, the founder of philosophy, whose restless intellect constantly challenged the ebb and flow of society. In 399 BC, the brilliant orator was accused of questioning the existence of gods and corrupting the minds of young males in the city. In the Agora, a stone has been excavated, where some believe Socrates stood to swear of his innocence. Athenians, I am not going to argue for my own sake, but for yours. If you kill me, you will not easily find a successor to me who, if I may, am sort of a gadfly given to the state by God, Socrates. The jury thought otherwise. The founder of philosophy was condemned to death. Socrates was forced to drink a poisonous potion of hemlock. To many, his death symbolized the end of the Golden Age. And after decades of peace, the Athenians found themselves embroiled again in a bloody war. For every nation that lives peacefully, there will be many others to grow hard and push their arrogance to extremes. The gods attend to these things slowly, but they attend to those who put off God and turn to madness. Sophocles, 431 BC. The end of the glorious 5th century BC also marked the end of Athenian supremacy. In 403 BC, after 27 years of warfare, Athens was conquered by its former allies, the Spartans. Democracy had fallen the Athenian spirit was waning. If the defeat in the Peloponnesian War wasn't enough, a devastating plague had swept through Athens, taking thousands of lives, including their great leader, Pericles. With the death of Pericles, many wondered what was to become of Athens' monuments. 
For centuries, the city fell into the hands of many conquerors. Some respected Athens' sacred monuments, such as Alexander the Great of Macedonia. But then came the Romans, who not only conquered, but plundered. When the Romans first came into contact with the Greek world, they did so militarily. Their warriors made off with a great deal of Greek art as plunder and booty from their military success. But at the same time, uh, they were extraordinarily respectful of Greek education and Greek culture, and even the taking off of this material uh, represented a desire to participate uh, in Greek civilization. As time went on, this bond between Athens and Rome became very strong. Much of Greek civilization survived through the medium of the Roman Empire. During the Byzantine Empire of 435 AD, foreign attitudes towards the monuments began to change. A Christian basilica was built in the center of the Parthenon. Cultic worship in the temples was outlawed. The 40-foot statue of Athena had already been melted down to harvest its precious gold and ivory. Nothing remains of the original statue. There exists only miniature marble replicas of the supreme goddess. Destruction on the Acropolis was gradual until the Turkish invasion of 1456, when the monuments suffered their greatest devastation. The Turks destroyed the temple of Athena Nike and used its marble for building material fortifying the Propylia or entranceway. Inside the Parthenon, a mosque was built, replacing the church. And there too, inside the Parthenon, the Turkish military stored their powder magazine. So by the time the Turks got to Athens and Greece, it was a brutal, brutally impoverished, underpopulated country. It wasn't anything the Athenians could do then. There was nothing there left of their past. By then, many of the monuments simply had decayed. You know, if you don't maintain a building, it falls down eventually. During this time, foreign visitors to Athens tried to keep the image of the worn monuments alive by making detailed drawings of them. But then, on an evening of September of 1687, the unspeakable happened. Warring Venetians bombed the Parthenon, hitting the powder magazine. The most splendid temple known to man came crashing down on two sides. The Acropolis became a bedlam of broken marble. Many of Phidias' finely sculpted friezes shattered into pieces. Athens' monumental achievement was in shambles. People no longer looked at the ruinous temples as works of art. Athenians hauled away wagon loads of broken marble to use to build their homes. Say you wanted to build your own house. There was a building. All you needed to do was just dismantle it and take the stone away. And in many ways, what survives is some of the blocks that people did not want to use. For example, columns and some of the more decorated elements of a building sometimes survive better than the square blocks because the square blocks are more useful in later buildings. Foreign visitors pocketed sculpted fragments from the Parthenon as souvenirs of its past glory. Treasure hunters from all over Europe came to pillage the monuments for profit, maliciously slashing off the valuable heads from Greek sculptures. When coming down to the citadel of the Acropolis, I took a piece of marble from the Parthenon, and since then, I have always taken something from the monuments. This is probably our greatest loss, that um, it is these sculptures, these reliefs that have been either stolen or destroyed by barbarians, including Christians who thought that they should destroy these pagan images, or simply being looted by later European countries. Of all the plunderers who ventured to Athens, none were more controversial than Lord Elgin of Scotland. Elgin was an 18th century Scottish nobleman who was appointed ambassador to Istanbul and the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. Elgin became obsessed with purchasing antiquity. While on a visit to Athens, 
he set his sights on the temples of the Acropolis. In 1802, Lord Elgin received permission from the Turkish authority, who was then in charge of Athens, to remove the sacred sculpture from the Parthenon. The citizens of Athens were outraged by Elgin's attempt to ravage the Acropolis of its masterpieces. But at the time, there was strong competition among Western Europeans, particularly the French and British, for collecting remnants of Greek sculpture and Greek architecture. Lord Elgin was said to have had mixed emotions about pillaging the monuments, but at the same time, he was very eager to bring parts of Athens' past back to England. With saws and chisels, Lord Elgin's men stripped the Parthenon of much of its treasures. They took 12 statues, 56 panels from its infamous frieze, and 15 metopes. Many of these marbles smashed to pieces when lowered to the ground. Elgin then set his sights on the sacred Erechtheion and removed one of its columned maidens and replaced it with a plain marble column. The Athenians were outraged. Had Elgin gone too far? While sailing back to England with his harvest of plunder, Elgin's vessel was shipwrecked. Several marbles sunk to the ocean floor, never to be found. Some Athenians believed that Poseidon, god of the sea, took revenge on Elgin. Although Lord Elgin was later able to retrieve much of his sunken treasure trove. By collecting these remains of antiquity for the benefit of my country, and by saving them from future destruction, I was not impelled by the search for personal gain. Lord Elgin, 1816. Back in England, the marbles from the Acropolis were proudly displayed in the British Museum, where they remain today. Yet the controversy surrounding Elgin and the marbles continues. Was he a protector or plunderer of Athens' sacred monuments? He was a person who believed in what he was doing. We call him a plunderer today, and from our point of view today, it's justified but I don't believe that he thought of himself that way at all. He was a man mad for the classics. Today, the Greek government is petitioning to have the infamous Elgin marbles returned to a new museum being built in Athens. However, the British government has refused to return them. Should the Elgin marbles be returned to Athens? Many people would say yes, that these sculptures belong with the original building. It's a complicated ethical question and one that deserves serious consideration and, and debate. My feeling is that the Greeks uh, today in Athens are well able to take care of the marbles in a proper way. And my feeling is that the, the marbles should be returned to Athens. There are two sides to the question. It's very hard to uh, uh, take a side of it. But I know that if I were a teacher in the University of Athens, I would passionately want them back, you know, born Greek and brought up in the Greek heritage. One understands that. It took centuries for the country of Greece to reclaim its independence. Now, how is the city of Athens attempting to reclaim its past? Every marble is labeled, no stone has been left unturned. These are the archaeologists and architects who work on the Acropolis. They're a massive team determined to piece back together the monumental mysteries of Athens' past while fighting the modern day forces of erosion and pollution. The first excavations began on the Acropolis in 1837 with the founding of the Archaeological Society. Between 1885 and 1891, archaeologists from all over the world began unearthing treasures that revealed the brilliance of the Acropolis temples. Early discoveries were the 12 statues of maidens called Cori, found near the Erechtheion, which had not been seen in two and a half millennia. At one time, hundreds of these sculptures were scattered amongst the temples as presents to the goddess Athena. 
Almost all the original marbles from the Temple of Athena Nike, which was destroyed during the Turkish invasion, were collected and used to entirely reconstruct the temple to its former splendor. The sacred Erechtheion has also been completely rebuilt stone by stone. Yet without the existence of drafting plans, notes, or photographs, how are these archaeologists and architects able to reconstruct these ancient temples? Always there are problems which uh, come uh, up uh, during uh, the works. And so, uh, Dr. Tesos uh, Tanulis is an architect really, uh, who has made unlocking the secrets of the Acropolis a lifelong endeavor. He has been responsible for locating and numbering most of the marbles on the Acropolis. By studying these broken pieces, as well as unearthing the foundations of these ancient temples, Dr. Tanulis and his colleagues are trying to solve the world's greatest jigsaw puzzle. When the exact position on the building uh, is uh, identified, is found, uh, we give another number which sh shows exactly which place of the monument of this block was originally. It is uh, like a puzzle. I mean, it goes only in one place, not in many places. So this is something good, but of course you understand that uh, it needs um, a lot of experience and, uh, how to say, a familiarity with the uh, object, the material, the archaeological material of the building. Restoration work on the Parthenon is far from over. Yet will restoring these limestone temples enable archaeologists to make new discoveries about Athens' past? This whole concept that we have of looking at a building like the Parthenon with its glimmering white pentelic marble is very much a modern concept. We know, for example, with buildings like the Parthenon, we're also painted in bright colors, reds and blues and blacks. It allows us to look at the past in a totally different way. There are numerous buildings in Athens uh, that we know of that we have not yet uncovered. Uh, one could start with the town hall or the Prytaneion, where the eternal flame was kept. We've never found that. That's one of the pleasures of excavation, is you never know what you're going to find, absolutely. And you stand always to learn a great deal more about Greek history or Greek civilization, but you, you can't predict it until you start. Today, the ancient monuments of Athens are only a shell of their former glory. Many stripped of their sculpture, roofs, and very foundations. The ancient sacrifices and rituals that took place in and around these shrines are lost in the pages of history books. Although much has been either forgotten or destroyed, why do these crumbling monuments still fascinate modern-day visitors to Athens? that even today, looking at these remains, which are so partial and even rather sad, we still sense that sense of aspiration and achievement and aesthetic perfection that is there intrinsically in the buildings. So I would say that it's the buildings themselves that are the principal lure for visitors today. Athens still remains a fertile bastion for those in search of an ancient past through its monuments that have survived the test of time. Future ages will wonder at us as the present age wonders at us now. Pericles, 